Bless us, O morning star, in these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty. Sixie here, and I'll see you in five minutes. Cinco minutos, por favor. Three more minutes. I just need you to wait two more minutes.
Bless us, O morning star, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty, through the ruler of demons, our Lord. Amen. Woo! Well, hello. How are you doing today? Let me just fix my... There we go. Sorry about that. Anyways, I hope everyone's well. I am really excited because I'm enjoying the fall. It's my favorite time of year, actually. I'm finding myself rather excited as the harvest from my May planted tomatoes, eggplant, zucchinis, cucumber, potatoes, corn, pumpkins are all coming to fruitation. So with a good fall harvest, of course, means amazing food. Ay, ay, ay! I guess this, this, uh, show just really wants you to see the beach. <laughs> I hope that you guys have some nice gardens coming out this year as well. I also really, really, really love scary movies and Halloween is just awesome. I love candy. I love everything fall is just great. Okay. Everything fall. So today I'm going to talk about a Netflix original by Daria Politan. It's called the devil in o the devil in Ohio. And it's a suspense thriller. The music was composed by Bishop Briggs and Will Bates. And I was actually really happy with this. I was so happy, in fact, I wanted to just toss out a sample. This is Salvation from the Dawn. I think I have a thing with Irish music in general, but that was just amazing. And then we have this Bishop Briggs and Will Bates set up right here. Darkness, hear me calling. I'm waiting here. Thoughts of you are gnawing. I'm lost in fear. Yet again. of the fire as we reach for something higher with as we all come over that was just fantastic i really really like the soundtrack that they put together they did an amazing job i just wanted to kind of showcase that bishop briggs is amazing and i just really am glad i found her So there's also Isabella Summers and Faye Wolf that added to the soundtrack, just to toss that out there. The music in this movie is all around great. I'm just a huge Bishop Briggs fan. My apologies. <laughs> now, I don't know if you remember when you were a kid and, uh, I don't know if you remember when you were a kid and seeing for the first time that the horrifying movie you just watched was based on a real story. Because I remember the first time I saw that a horror movie was based off a true story and it scared me so bad. I was so scared, in fact, I called, I called Blockbuster to ask if it was real. Luckily for me, the guy realized he was talking to a freaked out little girl with inadequate supervision. And he, he talked me down. He was like, oh, no, it's all fake. It's all fake. Which, sadly, that's not the world we live in. 
it seems this book was actually inspired by true stories, but in this case, I found the true stories more disturbing than the actual movie itself. They used, inform um, they used inspiration from events like January 1990, where a paramilitary religious cult leader, Jeffrey Lundgren, <laughs> Lundgren and 12 of his followers that were indicated, they were indicted at Lake County Common Pleas Court, basically, and is what they did was in April 1989, they did an execution style murder of dennis avery his wife cheryl and then what's the, like the most disturbing part about this story to me is they also killed their three daughters trina rebecca and karen Whew, it's dark okay i was happy with the psychological aspect of the devil in ohio it is a really twisted story about may dodd played by madeline arthur and she's found scared and traumatized in an Ohio roadway after running out of a cornfield with a knife she tosses away that's later found by police. And she has this huge pentagram that was carved into her back that she has to take medication for. She has to keep bandaged. It, it was a pretty bad injury from what it looked. Psych doctor Suzanne Marthas bonds with her at the hospital and May begins to reveal that she actually escaped from a satanic cult. I have to admit, it gets a little teeny bopper. It shows the inter interpersonal aspects of May Dodd and how she potentially psychologically attacks her 15-year-old roommate. Which, I don't know. The teeny bobber stuff got kind of old pretty fast. So she was supposedly attacking her 15-year-old roommate by doing stuff like taking her crush, I guess. So Jules Marthas is played by Exaria Dotson. She's the daughter of Suzanne Marthas. She's play um, and Suzanne Marthas is actually played by Emily Deschanel. And then Peter Marcus, her husband, is played by Sam Yeager. Sam thinks that May is absolutely weird. Sorry, my, my mistake. Peter thinks May is absolutely weird and fears her because of her past connections and the present reactions to triggers when they come up. He also blames her for situations that are really outside of, of her control. I don't, I, I didn't really like his character. In general, everything that happened regarding May turned out to be rather nice for him. Like, he had this massively over-customized house that no one wanted to buy, and it ended up getting burnt to the ground. He got blamed for it, but it wasn't his fault, and they ended up proving that pretty easily. So he got all that money from the insurance and didn't, wasn't absolutely screwed over there. The daughter ended up really happy, too. Um... So Jules ends up seeing the trauma that May had been through with her humongous gash on her back. And she shares her life with her, gives her a room, and they get super close. This is when you see May do really odd things like pray to a morning star of all demons <laughs> during grace. Or she turns a cross upside down in a potential foster home. She takes just one photo off of jules photo wall and it's just of her crush which i thought was really weird she starts interfering with her position at the school newspaper in photography as well as getting asked to the school dance by jules crush that she super liked that she took off the wall that picture off the wall earlier if you notice may doesn't really speak much and when she does she's pretty careful with her words Jules was angry as hell when May was asked to the dance by her crush, and May said she didn't care about the dance and she wouldn't go with him, but May just didn't believe her or forgive her. You know May understands that people will lie about what they want when they feel hopeless, which is shown in the scene where she was told about her new living arrangement that she didn't want to go to, but she pretends to be happy. 
May students asked how the other adopted child, Danny, played by Naomi Tan, and the family actually got to stay while she was helping her stretch, and she starts pulling her too hard, scaring the crap out of Naomi. Her envy even more clear when she's wearing Jules's mother's dress that Jules re rejected to wear, and she tells Jules that she just doesn't appreciate what she has at all. You hear May wishing to stay so many times, and she even makes this altar. She keeps asking if she wasn't where Lucifer had intended her to be, why would she be so happy? Why was she being treated the way she was? Not all Satan, not all Satan, not all Satanism is about being evil and using black magic. The battle between good and evil often. In, the battle between good and evil. In, the, the, sorry, guys. The battle between good and evil often comes down to each person's perception, their personal values, and their beliefs. Experiencing extreme repetitive trauma can have rather unpredictable results on your perceptions, leaving you with not knowing quite what normal is, what is expected of you or others. You become trained to respond in a way that's meant to protect yourself or the people around you or in a way that someone else wanted you to be, basically. Our, pro our projections... Our perceptions form our reality regardless of their accuracy. The way the movie was filmed gave me the indication that May's feelings were pretty real and she was not wanting to necessarily hurt anyone in the family. Going as far as to even try to drug uh, Jules to sleep to protect her from her satanic brother Noah made this big elaborate dinner just to try to... She even goes and gets her in the end, but she, she protects Jules there. When her scar shows her reaction with the use of the camera and how they made the sounds, it felt like she was actually kind of freaked out genuinely. But then they give like little indications that it's all fake. So you really don't know. It's very ambiguous. It felt like her beliefs of what Lucifer would actually want were valid in her own mind actually trusting the answer to come from her god like a christian would trust the answer to come from their god after praying at her altar it almost looked like she put her faith into her dark ruler stating that hey if you want me to do this i'll do this and I, i'm not gonna break this chain but if you don't you'll stop this i i put my faith in lucifer so she trusts lucifer Lucifer to make his call and she starts the ceremony at the dance with the white roses. Another thing I found interesting in this story was they presented Satan's side of the whole fight in the biblical Christian version of God and Satan, referring to the Christian God as the jealous God. She seemed to want her answer to her future and place in the world, and she wanted her indecision to be over. She wanted to feel grounded, but she didn't want to break that chain again by abandoning her place. Her devotion and her beliefs felt extremely real. Was her lack of knowledge simply due to not understanding the world outside the cult that she lived in her whole life, or was may evil or is the real evil simply the judgment and rejection of our society regarding the ones that walk through life confused or brainwashed by the views of people that only had their own interests in heart their own desires or some of them have their own trauma they're dealing with and they're putting it on other people wanting their shortcomings to be lessened and not really taking accountability for their choices. Making them jealous or afraid of another person that's sometimes already beat to the ground or envious even. Or are these the people that just want you to feel responsible for them when you're not? <laughs> it is hard to decide what and who the victim, hero, and persecutor is in this movie. My end conclusion was that they all kind of are in their own right. All the main characters seem to be evil and good in their own ways. 
I liked the use of symbols and the explanation of how symbols and situations can affect us all. Example is Dr. Suzanne's mother. She would make her a pie when her, fa her stepfather was treating her really horrible. When she was being really codependent with her stepfather. And then she passes that recipe on to her and then she starts making her daughters the pie while she's missing them on a holiday Thanksgiving just, and ends up spending that holiday with May instead. It just kind of felt like they were using that pie symbol as like she, they were passing the codependency on, passing that pattern on. The inverted cross, Peter was actually crucified upside down on the cross, as the story goes, because he didn't want to be cruci crucified the same way Jesus was, because he didn't felt like he deserved such an honor. And people like to make fun of that in the satanic religion, I do believe. Also, the sign of Chinar, or the sign of the wish granter, or even Lucifer. Full moon, an upside down pentagram. That's where the pentagram with the odd point, it's directed downwards. And that's the religious um, symbol for Satanism. I also thought it was interesting that they used pigs a lot, quite like quite a bit in this. If you remember in Deuteronomy 14.8 or Mark 5.13, it talks about 2,000 pigs and 2,000 demons. The demons enter the pigs and Jesus ends up drowning them all, but kind of interesting because they seem to want Lucifer resurrected. They want this, the son of Lucifer to come almost. That, that's what it sounded like. I also liked it because the pig head kind of reminded me of human evil and violence in the Lord of the Flies where they cut the head off signifying the sacrifice of innocence. The white rose symbolizes the Virgin Mary a lot of times in Christianity, loyalty, purity, and what I feel like it mainly represented in this movie was innocence. Fire is resonance and energy. A lot of people during winter, winter solstice ceremonies, they really find it important to recognize the double nature of fire as a creator and a punisher. So they use that a lot in festivals or whatnot. There are quite a few branches of Satanism. You have modern Satanism, which is best considered an umbrella term for a wide variety of sets of beliefs and practices, truly. In general, they all reject Western morals and laws, and they replace them with a combined package of positive self-image and a decided lack of conformity. Satanists themselves range from individuals who simply followed a self-centered philosophy to organized groups with meeting houses, scheduled events. There are so many different types of satanic groups. The best, I believe, are, that is known is actually the Church of Satan. They embrace a more... It's about you approach, like make, making yourself happy and those around you happy. And people are either your enemy or they're, they're either for you or against you. There's a chapter on BDSM in that, that book about how it's okay to beat people. Well, they created a, a pretty wanted book it's one of the most readily available texts for the satanic religion created it's very well known it's one of the most public organizations for for sure then you have esoteric satanism which is like the temple of set that is more a subset so they broke off from the church of satan 
because they had some philosophical issues regarding the setup. So they formed a splinter group, the Temple, the temple of Set, in resulting a the it's a theolistic it's theolist, uh, the, theistic Satanism where they recognize the existence of one or more supernatural beings where the major god is viewed as a father or older brother and is often called Satan. But some groups identify the leader as a version of an ancient Egyptian god, Set. Set is a spiritual entity based on the ancient Egyptian notion of Exper, translated as self-improvement or self-creation. Regardless of the beings or beings in charge, none of them really represent the Christian Satan in that one. The one that, the only one I really found that uh, hit more of the cliche, I think, was the early Satanism. reactive Satanism where they actually adopted the stories of the mainstream religion but they inverted the value thus Satan is still an evil god as defined in Christianity but one to be worshipped rather than shunned then we have Luciferians <laughs> Luciferians they combine elements of rational and theoristic forms theistic why can't i say theistic very well today sorry theistic forms it's largely theistic branch although there are some who see satan called lucifer as symbolic rather than an actual being the term lucifer for luciferians is more meant in the literal sense of light bringer in latin i believe i think that's latin light bringer in latin Anti-cosmic Satanism, or also known as chaos Gnosticism. These are the only ones I would actually be kind of afraid of. An example of them would be the Misanthropic Luciferian Order, or the Temple of Black Light. They believe the cosmic order that was created by God is a fabrication, and from what I understand, they do a little more extreme things. And you have transcend transcendental, <laughs> transcendental Satanism, which is created by a guy named Matt the Lord Zane. <laughs> That's funny, I like that. And he was an adult video director whose brand of Satanism came to him in a dream after taking LSD. <laughs> and they seek a form of spiritual evolution with the end goal of each individual having a reunification with his or her inner satanic aspect adherents feel that the satanic aspect in life is a hidden part of the self that is separate from the consciousness and they believe believers can find their way to that self by following an individually determined path then you have demonolatry not demon not demonology Demonolatry. Tree is when you study it. Demonolatry is when you worship demons. But some sets see demons as more of like a separate form of energy that can be used to aid in particular rituals of magic as opposed to what you would normally assume. The book entitled Modern Demonology, oh, oops, I said that wrong, sorry guys, I, I even explained this earlier, Modern Demonolatry by S. Connolly lists well over 200 demons from a multitude of different religions, ancient and modern, adherents choose to worship demons that mirror their own attributes or ones with whom they share a connection. Then yeah, the Satanic Reds. They view Satan as a dark force that has existed since the beginning of time. States individuals must follow their own chakras to find their inner force. 
That inner force exists in everyone and is trying to evolve according to each individual's environment. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And then you have Christian-based Dathis, uh, Thaisum, Dwathaisum, <laughs> or polylistic Satanism, Satanism, and they believe that there is an ongoing war between the Christian God and Satan, but unlike Christians, they support Satan. Another offshoot of this type of Satanism would be the Church of Azazel, which referred to Satan as one of many gods. The Process Church of the Final Judgment, also known as the Process Church, the Process Church of the Final Judgment, is it's a religious group established in London in the 1960s by two people who were actually kicked out of Scientology. <laughs> and together... Mary Ann McLean and Robert D. Grimson developed their own practices based on four gods, which was Jehovah, Lucifer, Satan, and Christ, the great gods of the universe. And none of them are actually evil or good. Instead, they exemplify different patterns in human existence, some which each member selects one or two of the four that is closest to their own personality, and that's who they, yes. Then we have the cult of Kulalu, and that's based on an HP Love class, uh, HP Lovecraft novels. The cult of Kulalu are small groups which have arisen with the same name but have radically different goals. Some believe that the fictional character or creature was real and will eventually usher an era of chaos and uninhibited violence wiping out humanity in the process. Others simply subscribe to the philosophy of Kalu, uh, sorry, Kalalu, Kalalu, a philosophy of co cosmic indifferentism, that the universe is meaningless and a mechanical system that is indifferent to the existence of human beings altogether. Other members of the cult are not satanic or not Satanists at all. They just really, really like Lovecraft. They love to celebrate Lovecraft's ingenuity. The battle between good and evil often comes down to each person's perception, personal values, and beliefs. Experiencing extreme repetitive trauma can have unpredictable results on those perceptions, leaving you with a situation where you don't really know what normal is. What is expected? You become trained to respond in a way that's meant to protect yourself or the people around you. Our perceptions form our reality regardless of their accuracy. What defines good and evil often comes down to subjective values and perceptions. Experiencing abuse can have unpredictable results on anyone's perception and future reactions. Perceptions form our reality regardless of their accuracy. Like I said, the way this, fil the way this film is filmed, it gave me the indication that what May was showing in her perceptions was actually real. It, like, for instance when her dress kind of falls and everyone can see her scar the way that the the camera moved and the sounds it, it really felt like she was actually freaked out <laughs> i don't know if she was constantly manipulating everyone because it's not like she lied to anyone excluding pretending to be okay with things when she was not. An example is she asked why you didn't, she didn't want to live at the foster home she found, and she said there's no place to hide because God was everywhere. There was no place to hide from God, I assume. It felt like her beliefs of what Lucifer would actually want were real. Watching it, felt like she was actually trusting the answer to come from Satan after praying at her altar. 
putting her faith in her dark ruler by seeing if anyone would actually stop her attempted murder this around, stop her from being burned alive and becoming the young bride she does not wish to be. Could she get her answer and her indecision would be over without breaking the chain by abandoning her place? Her devotion and beliefs felt real due to how the sound and camera angles felt several scenes. Was her lack of knowledge simply due to not understanding the world outside a cult that she lived in her whole life? Or was it that May was just freaking evil? Or is the real evil simply the judgmental assumptions and rejection our society gives to ones that walk through life differently or confused or traumatized, brainwashed by the views of people that only had their own interests at heart? Or are these just people that want you to feel responsible for them when, when you're not? The ones repeating destructive behaviors taught to them from those meant to protect them. Who is the victim? Who's the hero or the persecuted? Or are they all kind of in their own right in this story? It's always easy to try to find your scapegoat. It's much harder to look at yourself. They definitely all just felt wrong. They all, they were all evil. They were all good. <laughs> Characteristics that a leader needs to have in order to run a cult like this would be charisma and authority, authoritism. They want utter control of others, money, sex, free labor, loyal constituents, that's all fringe benefits. Most leaders take advantage of those, but their main desire is absolute control over their relationships. These leaders roll over isolating, steeply hierarchical, 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 I can say it, I know I can, High, hierarchical and closed structures, some uh, with front groups serving as transmission belts to the outside world. The leader, he's separated from the elite formation by the inner circle of the initiated who spread around him an aura of impenetrable mystery. This mystery adds to the feeling that the leader is everywhere and sees everything. Meanwhile, the leader keeps the inner circle off balance by sowing distrust and promoting and demoting personnel seemingly at random. They press people so tightly together their individual individuality is erased, causing this extreme form of groupthink, as are any trusting interactions among them destroyed. Everyone is a friend, but true friendship is supposed is suppressed as the divisions form and threat to take them away from their group or leader to lessen the attachment to that group to take their place. They want to maintain that hierarchy. Followers face this triple isolation from the outside world and from each other within this closed system and form their own internal dialogue where clear thinking about the group might not arise unless they are able to get out of that isolated state. The third element of this would be being able to create this exclusive belief system that's been controlled in, entirely by this leader and it empowers them through the creation of this fictional world of secrets and lies. An example of many BDSM cultures, they have the phrase, there are people that take care of issues when they arise. There are people that take care of the predators in, in this community. When the truth is, not only will no one take care of you, they will judge you, persecute you, steal from you, use your weakness for their benefit. When you have nothing left, they'll toss you out like trash. The only people that will help you is the police. Also, the fact that you are BDSM will only be used against you at court. Make it harder. No one will help you. In one case, someone asked for $5,000 just to testify on what BDSM is in court. Financial fraud is also prevalent. People will donate money, volunteer, pay rent. They won't claim it or do anything that they're supposed to do there. With many no access to knowledge of the internal life of the inner circle and the reality of their leadership, they just keep propping them up and keep, keep helping that momentum go. 
The lies create a fictional world that become more and more bizarre, elaborate, far from norm normal, and the further they go into that system, the crazier the ideas get. After a while, things that seem preposterous seem normal. I noticed in the BDSM scene, you could watch people's little pages on their website, and their limits would go from A and end up at Z rather fast, where they're, they would just be pushed farther and farther and farther back until eventually they have 55 needles in their leg wanting to be loved and accepted when that's not actually love. The fictional invented quality of the total ideology reinforces the confusion and eventual disassociation experienced by the followers from suicide vests to abuse of others. The extreme disconnect leaves the followers helpless to understand what's actually happening. If you try to get clarification, they say it's something you can't understand or that you just don't get it. And soon preposterous things seem normal. Like, the fiction starts slowly becoming real in your mind. And, of course, propaganda intended for public and wider world also comes down. After the propaganda comes the indoctrination, the state where the system finds the quiet... It's the quiet of an imaginary world after smoking mirrors of the curtain and the total ideology has dropped. So no questions or doubts are allowed. Should you voice your concerns, a network of monitors will definitely ensure you are dealt with. Should that fail, then you are cut from the group. Normally lied about, persecuted, never to speak with any of the people you had so much for again. Literally shunned. For a system to wield complete control, the leader must tap into the fear of others. Brainwashing that totalist systems engage in is one of the most psychological, cohesive, manipulative situations where a leader or group literally will alternate terror with love. The left right is going to get you! <laughs> when we are frightened, we don't simply run away from the fear, but we run to a safe ha haven to someone, a group, or something, and that someone is usually a person to whom we feel attached, but when that supposed safe haven is also the source of the fear, then running to that person is a rather failing strategy, causing the frightened person to freeze, trapped between this approach and avoidance stage. Fear-based relationships, disorganized attachment, this all has a twofold result. A confused emotional bonding to the source of fear and this failed attempt to seek comfort and cognitive disassociation that is the inability to think about one's own one's own feelings fear without escape fright without solution as attachment researchers refer to it it's a traumatic state that derails the person the person's ability to think logically and clearly about what the situation even is therefore to take action to resolve it is rather difficult or even tell people that you're in it. Further, never achieving safety from the threat, they will keep returning to the relationship trying to gain that safety. Having disabled logical thinking about the traumatic relationship, the leader can then introduce even more of a fictitious ideology to explain away or redirect the follower's terror. It's really a positive re it's really a positive feedback loop with bio a biochemical elements. Psychologically, the victim is engaged in an effort to manage or control their anxiety levels by seeking proximity to a safe haven, but never succeeding in attaining adequate comfort. It's for this reason we can predict that cultic systems will attempt to interfere with and control any alternative attachment relationships to that person that that, that person might have. To do so would fail and would allow the follower to find a different safe haven elsewhere or potentially escape the emotional and cognitive control of the group. This is the same thing we see con in controlling relationships such as in cases of domestic violence, Stockholm syndrome. Frequent, we, we see this frequently with pimps and prostitutes, slave dom relationships, as well as human trafficking. 
fear, sleep de uh, being sleep deprived, isolated from all close people in a group in that are not in your group or that group, and facing constant criticism, you become trapped, unable to think independently. At the same time, the group positioned itself as the only safe haven for you. Different groups have different fear arousing themes and methods. The oncoming apocalypse, fear of outsiders, fear of punishment, fear of losing democracy, losing people you love, being alone, never being accepted by anyone else, never having anyone to love you like them. Among many of these threatening strategies, I, I find just the need of love used rather massively but the leader is always the sole survivor and the one that will lead them away or through the fear that they are experiencing kind of like hitler was going to lead germany through the economic issues that they were having and they'll lead them to wonderful safety and wonderfulness and isolating and fear-driven symptoms led by authority and figures yield deployable followers who override their own survival needs and an and an anonymity in the service of a group this creation is of the deployable followers is a rather large step in having a cult or cult like system because at that point they feel like they would just do anything for their leader overlook anything that leader does they can do no wrong in your arm to, in your in your mind to even question why was so much money taken from my money that even even questioning that is wrong in your mind they would never hurt you they would never kick you when you were down they would notice if you were getting hurt while you were vulnerable when really they are either the ones hurting you or using you or they could give up less Every day in the media, we can see destructive power of this cohesive psychological control put into place by pathological leaders, whether it is parents who neglect or abuse their children under a leader's command or terrorists who blow themselves up for fictional liberation. Once this fear-based control is in place, it's quite difficult to break. The followers' disassociation and disorganized emotional attachment to the leader or group makes it feel extremely difficult to look clearly at what's actually happening. In fact, any attempt to do so only creates more fear, causing this further disorganized bonding to the group. To attempt to ease the stress, they'll try harder to get that, that bonding that they're not going to get. The greater man's ignorance of the principles of his social surroundings, the more subject he is to their control. Adults who were born or raised in cults and extreme fundamental religions or former child soldiers, as well as long-term members of some BDSM house or communities. In a time of rapid change, huge movements of people and a general sense of instability, these people are naturally going to seek security and stability and these cults are rather successful during these types of conditions and given the right circumstances almost anyone is vulnerable to the psychological and situational pressures triggers and techniques that are used to assist in the process of being controlled The way questioning your trust is not fathomable, even in your own mind, using the system of rewards and punishments, creating the sense of powerlessness, fear, and dependency, and re reforming the followers' behaviors and attitudes all within a closed system of logic. Most effective when human communication was controlled, centered around the isolation of the follower from everyone except the other cult members or kidnappers. If the situation is strong and isolating enough without any clear escape route, the average person can cave into the traumatizing pressures of brainwashing. The process was to isolate the victims from their prior connections and to stabilize their identity, then consolidate a new submissive identity with an originally bound new network. This was achieved by alternating a regime of threats with conditional approval, and the reach of others can have quite a bit on the soul. Quite a, a, quite a big effect on the soul. That need for love can be intense. 
I liked this Ohio-based thriller due to the fact that you can tell the writer really went into the research of the different psychological ways people control other people. From the Cartman drama triangle presented many times, the hero, Dr. Suzanne, the victim, Jules, the persecuted Suzanne, May, as well as the husband, Peter, by Suzanne. The victim persecutor mentality is a rather reoccurring theme throughout the series. All in, I would give it, I would give the, I would say The Devil's Advocate is worth watching, but not as something that will scare you. I find it more of something to watch that is interesting. Well, thank you for watching Satan's Buttered Toast. This is Toast, your host. Thank you for watching, signing out. Stay toasty! <laughs> Mwah!